Yeah, re uh, regarding that data set, um, I was just looking at other data sets, like they, they're all exactly like kind of like the same cropping, the same type of like, uh, is, is it like a big problem when it's not really? Because uh, I chose an artist, but he does like drawings and then he does sculptures and then he does, but it's all kind of similar style. And um, that's what I ended up like putting together kind of, but I just wanted to know if it was like a big difference from it or. Yeah, who knows? Uh, the truth is, like, I tend to find that, like, um, I also made a data set this weekend or this week. Um, actually, I made that Michelle Heslop, um, her artwork. I, I, like, just finished it up and put it into a data set, and I trained my own version last night, and I was really disappointed with the results and kind of surprised. So this is uh, kind of uncharted territory, and you just sort of find out um, whether things work well or not. So we'll actually um, – I'll go over a couple of things about just sort of, like, what you might expect to see and maybe, like – um, how things work and don't, but yeah, I, I tend to find that like the best thing to do is just to try it and see what happens. Um, sometimes it works out really well and sometimes it doesn't and uh, you kind of can work your way backwards from there to sort of figure out what, what happened or like if there are ways to improve it. So we'll see. Um, with that in mind, did anyone else produce a data set that they want to share or like um, talk about like just sort of the process? I made a few different sets. Uh, but I'm not sure which one like, they're all kind of quite different. So I don't, I guess it'll be a matter of experimenting to see. Um, unfortunately, like I'm on two computers right now. I have the computer with runaway isn't the same as this. So sharing is kind of tricky <laughs> using this, but I could slack it later. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Throw it in slack. That'd be really helpful. Sure, um, I'll do that. Yeah. And then I think the other thing is, um, hopefully like with the hundred dollars you have, um, for this class, like most of that will go to training. Um, as I'm sure you'll notice. Um, so I recommend trying a couple trainings. You can probably do a couple um, with that hundred dollars. So um, try those and see what happens. Um, yeah. Cause I think again, it's sort of like, I tend to find that some things work really well and other things don't work well at all. And I'm often surprised by which is which. Um, yeah. So just give it a shot and see what happens. Uh, I had one too that I'll share in the, in the group. Um, one, which was, I wanted to see if uh, I could make like like a coffee maker, but like <laughs> like a generator, um, so sort of like latte art from the top down. And I found a guy who had like a whole bunch of photos of like pretty much the same composition. I only once I like whittled it down out of like he had a lot of photos of it was just like coffee and his baby. Uh, and so once I didn't have no baby, and then like. I, I just stuck to like white marble back, like one backdrop and like similar composition. Um, I have, I think it's like 300, which is like maybe a little low, but then there was another one I did that's an account that does uh, hibiscus and it's all like the exact same image, just like different hibiscus. So I think that'll be cool. Um, so I'll share those in the Slack. Yeah, awesome. That sounds cool. Yeah, and I think 300 is, probably around the low end but again i think if they're like really well set up sometimes it works still um i mean i've seen people who have done 100 images in runway and it's worked out um and then i've got other models where i've tried it with thousands of images and they just don't work as well for whatever reason um so again it's it's a little hit or miss i think again the i think we talked about this last week but if you can imagine almost like onion skinning where it's like they're laying or right over top of each other if they're perfectly lined up you can get away with a smaller data set um as long as they still have that uh sort of lineup but then if you've got other stuff that's a little bit more tangled or a little bit more different you might want more images overall so um yeah so look forward to seeing um those those data sets anyone else i can share mine um, yeah. I'll share my screen really fast. Yeah, please. Okay, so um, my mom likes to collect uh, Delftware, which is this type of um, pottery. It's known for this like blue pattern. Um, so I'm going to try to see if I can either recreate the pattern um, or see if it can come up with new shapes. It's most well known for the plates. So I kind of have to decide, or at least the pattern. So I kind of have to decide if I should just choose one type of pottery or just throw them all in. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I recommend maybe actually trying both. So doing one that's okay. maybe just plates and then another one that's um, more of the, the 
all over the place because um, I think you might get some interesting shapes out of those. The one mm -hmm. thing I'd recommend is that um, it looks like some of those images you've got um, that are rectangles. Um, I might play around with turning those into squares by maybe just stretching the edges or okay. um, there's the ones where it's sort of like at the bottom of the screen you've got the the pottery but then there's a lot of white space above. Yeah. I might like try and open those in Photoshop and just crop around the, the bottom. Um, runway by default will, and we'll look at a little bit of this um, in a, just a minute, but um, runway by default will center crop everything, which means you might lose some of the shapes. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways to do some cropping inside of runway itself, um, but it can be a little slow to do it manually, but um, we can walk through the process for that as well. Cool, thanks. Anybody else want to share theirs? I had no time to work on a data set this week. Totally happens. And yeah, so um, we'll go through how to like basically set up your, your data set for training. And then um, obviously we'll have the recording of that. So you can always come back to it when you're ready. Um, I can share mine really quick. I, I, I grabbed a few. So let me just see what I can share here. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. So I've got a couple of different ones. Um, I was able to scrape uh, a bunch of black and white photos from an archive. So I have these to work with. Um, I actually got um, a bunch of wood block uh, paintings. And these actually turned out really well when I first ran it through. Um, so I have oh, yeah. uh, a couple of initial tests, but I just started running into issues around uh, resolution. And then I got into wanting to train my data set on another data set. Um, and so I was just wondering how to, how something like that can, can work. Cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff uh, today, especially on resolution, because um, I think one of the biggest annoyances or things that I sort of, I disagree with the way Runway um, establishes some things. So I'll walk you through how I would approach it. Um, and resolution being the biggest one for that. Um, because most of these models are resolution dependent. So you have to think a lot about um, what res resolution you're using when you're choosing uh, what data set to transfer from. So we'll definitely cover that today as well. Cool. I can share mine as well. Let me yeah. Share. Um, so I just did like a Instagram, one of my favorite Instagram dogs. Um, this one, I ended up getting about a thousand images, um, and there's like some variety in the um, in the composition and poses, but there's a lot of similarity. I think, and there's like you know maybe three or four different modes here. So really interested to see um, what turns out there. I did some other stuff too. I'm trying to figure out what to do with um, with like this slide slide share. I found like a um, I, I scraped this from Twitter. Uh, it's just like a bunch of um, PowerPoint slides from SlideShare. They're just kind of funny. But um, there's like a lot more variation here in terms of, like obviously they're all rectangles, so I'm not sure what the best thing would be to do there. But then there's a lot of text, which I'm kind of curious about, um, you know, like particularly just given the variety of color, I think that's probably not really going to turn out into something like legible, but it could be interesting. Um, but then also just in general, like a lot of the dimensions are really different. So I just have to kind of figure out what, how I want to maybe like, I was thinking of maybe trying a couple of different things here, um, but maybe that could get expensive. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, this one's going to be funny. Uh, this is one that will probably turn into what I would like call Gan Soup, which I'll show you. That's what happened to mine as well, um, which is sometimes cool, sometimes not. And again, it just sort of is dependent on what you want to um, get as a result and then how much money you want to spend. But we can definitely walk through um, how to set some of that up. I think also those are cases where if you have a lot of random dimensions, um, it's kind of a nice thing that Runway will just like sort of fix it all for you. Like it'll make it all work um, one way or another. So sometimes you can use that uh, to your advantage where there's like um, that data sets tool library that I have will be like kind of annoyed to like try to like manage all those. So um, yeah, we'll look at that when we play with that with the, the data set sort of like a uh, tooling that they have inside of um, Runway.
All right, awesome. This looks really cool. I'm really excited to sort of see what, what people produce and I think we'll have some fun with uh, some of these data sets. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can get started with class. So uh, just a reminder, here's where we are for the week. So we are at week three. Um, so we're mostly gonna look at training this week, um, a little bit of exports. Um, so basically we'll, we'll train a model. I've got a couple models that have already been trained. And then once, uh, once we go through the training process, then we'll also come back and sort of um, look at what we can do with those a little bit inside our own way. We might get, depending on how much time we have in class, we might get to a little P5JS at the very end, um, but that'll actually mostly be next week. So next week we'll look at how to like really play with these models um, using P5JS. We'll look at the P5JS web editor. Um, again, you don't need to know JavaScript for any of this stuff because um, I've got some pre-made um, code templates that we can use. Um, but if you do know a little JavaScript, you can also sort of see how we're, how we're making these and have some fun with them. So um, we'll look a little bit, we'll look mostly at that next week. Um, and I also wanna save time to start talking about sort of like, you know, making a project or that sort of thing. And week five will be mostly us just sharing what we made. Um, so it can be anything, again, whatever you made, like it can be the model you trained on, it can be a bunch of experiments you had. Um, you know, everyone will have like 10 minutes to sort of like just walk through like what they, played with in class and um, that sort of thing. So start thinking about just like, you know, putting together the, the materials you have and, and what you want to talk about. Um, it'll be very loose. There'll be no like harsh critiques. Um, no one will be crying by the end of it. It'll just be a way to like sort of share our work and and uh, sort of see what other people have made in class. Since we can't see each other in person, it's, it's nice to have sort of that moment. Um, so as I mentioned this week, we're going to look at, um, I'm actually going to do a real quick thing on runway plugins. Um, it's not something that I really focus on in this class, but I just want people to know about it. Um, and then we'll do a lecture on what is a GAN. So obviously um, this is a, uh, we'll be training a style GAN model and it's important to know sort of what a GAN is and how it trains. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll focus on training um, for most of the class as well as doing a little bit of interpolation, which I think we touched on last week a little bit, just um, in looking at how to do that in style GAN. Um, but we'll cover a little bit more of that as well as looking at how to just export um, a bunch of images uh, using Runway. Cool, so Runway plugins. Um, Runway does support a bunch, a bunch of plugins. There are two official ones. Um, those official ones are Unity and Photoshop. Um, I personally don't use Unity, so I don't know much about the Unity plugin. Um, but uh, if you're interested, you can go to this link and check out a little bit more about it. Um, and maybe install and run it if you are a Unity, Unity person. Um, the Photoshop plugin, they've supported for a while now. It is pretty interesting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a minute. Uh, so those are the two official plugins. There's a lot of unofficial plugins or plugins that are maybe built by the community and not by Runway themselves. Um, if you check out the Runway Slack channel, there are a bunch of folks talking about different um, plugins they have. So I'd know that maybe a couple of months ago, someone made, someone released a Grasshopper um, for Rhino plugin. And just this week, someone released a VVV, I think that's how you pronounce it, VVV, whatever. Um, what, one of those tools, uh, they just released a plugin for that as well. So um, in general, if you are like using other tools, you, you will probably find a plugin um, where you can send images from your application to Runway get things back um, and utilize them however you want in the tool you're using. Um, so it supports a lot of applications, like, you know, creative, like, uh, applications. There's also code samples um, on the Slack page for, you know, if you're a coder and you use processing or open frameworks or touch designer, there are a bunch of plugins for those as well, um, or at least code samples for those as well. So it might not be a packaged up thing, but there's some examples of how to send d data images back and forth. And next week, we're going to look at how to do this using P5, um, which is similar, it's sort of a similar process, except it's just JavaScript, so it's a little bit easier um, to set up everything. So uh, we'll look at that more next week, maybe a little bit in a day today. We'll see. Um, and then, you know, the key thing for all this stuff is to make sure that whatever you're sending um, from your application to the model is, is the right uh, input. So in Photoshop's case, you're always going to be sending images to the model. Um, so you can't really send, uh, like, you can't send text to the model and get an image back. Um, so the way it's the Photoshop plugin is set up is you always send an image, you always send a layer from Photoshop to Runway, and then you get a, a new image back in a new layer. Um, so that's sort of how the Photoshop plugin works. So um, 
and again, it's still sort of one to one. It's like it's nice in that you don't need to set up runway and like have have the model running. You can just sort of send it and you can get it back. But um, you do have to be aware about inputs and outputs, and then um, it's important to remember what size you get back. So like a lot of times, I will send an image from Photoshop that's you know a Photoshop layer of a, of a relatively large size to like the big bigan model. And I'll get back a 256 by 256 image, right? So it's like, it'll be tiny um, when you bring it back into Photoshop. So just be aware of, of those sort of limitations. Um, you can always find ways to work around them, but just be aware that like, it doesn't play as seamlessly as you might expect just because of how these models are meant to work. Uh, so the steps for installing the Photoshop plugin. So I have a video after this. Um, I, won't, I won't go through the entire process here, but um, I will say that like, the installation requires a little bit of work. Um, you do have to download this plugin from their plugin page. Uh, installing it is a little tricky. I go through the steps in the in the video that I, that I have in the next slide. Um, but once you get it installed, then you can again send a layer from Photoshop to Runway, and they come back as new layers in Photoshop. Um, and then again, remember image inputs and outputs matter. Um, so this is a video, I won't go through this video um, just because I want to talk mostly about training today. But if you are interested in playing with this, um, you can watch this video. I think it's like five or seven minutes um, about installing it and getting it up and running in, in Photoshop. So just be aware that like there are some cool like little add-ons for Runway um, if you want to play with those. Um, any other questions? Obviously this is just like to let you know that, hey, this thing exists. Um, but any questions about that Photoshop plugin? Um, cool, so let's talk a little bit about GANs. Um, so you might have noticed that in Runway, there are many models. There's a model called Style GAN, there's a model called Attention GAN, there's Cycle GAN. All of these things end in the word, end, end in the letters G-A-N. Um, and I don't think anyone asked in this class, but often it, the very first question people ask is like, why are these things all named GANs? Um, and the truth is like, they could be called anything, but people always tend to like to, highlight that they're GANs because GANs have been sort of the popular thing for the past couple of years. So GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network. Um, we'll talk a little about the adversarial part. You know why they're networks, right? Because that's the model. Um, and generative is that they produce new images. So there are two different types of like sort of models that you will often come, uh, come across, which is one is called a discriminative model. That is a model that decides whether something is of a category or is true or false. Um, and then you've got generative models which produce new images or new things from them. Um, so a generative model could be producing new audio or new text um, or new images. So the adversarial part is actually that we combine both of these models. So we have a, we, in a GAN, there is both a, gen, a generator and a discriminator. And they sort of play, play a game with each other um, and this is how we train these models. Um, so essentially the way this works is that the generator um, during the process of training generates new images from the data set it's seen. And the discriminator's job is to guess whether or not this image is true, is real or fake. Um, and then based on that, the model learns to get smarter. Um, so in the case of like the generator, it's sort of like you're trying to pass a fake image off to the discriminator as uh, as a real image um, and the discriminator is sort of like learning how smart it is or like how, how it's sort of like learning how to get better. So as it's sort of this process of where they're getting smarter and smarter and eventually you get a, like you should get a fairly real, realistic looking image. Um, so you go through this process sort of in a cycle and the common sort of like analogy for this is that imagine that the discriminator is like a bank teller and that the generator is sort of like someone trying to pass off fake bills. Um, so when you start, you get like a really like shitty looking dollar bill, right? And like the discriminator is not smart enough yet to know that this is fake or real. Um, and the generator is not yet good enough to produce real images. So you start in this place where like eventually the discriminator says, yeah, that looks like a real dollar bill. And then you tell the model like, oh, actually that's not. And it says, oh, okay. And it tries to like learn newer, new, better, smarter, and re smarter represent representations of these images. Um, and then you do it again, right? So now it's like, now the generator has learned color and the discriminator gets fooled again. And it says, okay, like, I think this is a real image. And then you say, nope, it's not. Now you need to like figure out why you, why you were faked out and why you just learned that um, to a place where like, maybe now it's starting to learn almost photorealism, some other things. Um, until you get to a place where I would say like, this is probably like the height of like 
this is how good of a quality you get with with a with a GAN, right? Where it's like it's learned that this almost looks like a dollar bill, but it's not like perfect, right? Um, you know, it sort of has a re it understands the representation. So this is the process of training, and this is why it takes a long time. Um, and we'll go over like the the process of training. Um, Runway calls these steps, right? And every one of these steps is when it shows um, the model a new set of fake images and the discriminator decides whether those are fake or real. And then it does a thing, what we call updating its weights. And its weights are really just like all the ways in which it decides whether an image is real or fake. Um, so those are, that's a step. So uh, when we go through the training process of a runway model, um, we'll often talk about how many steps did you train this for? And that's how many times did this model look at a bunch of fake images and decide whether they were fake or real and update its weights. Um, so training in runway, um, you can train you can train a lot of these models outside of runway. In fact, that's like the more common thing. Um, but training inside of runway is is pretty nice um, in that it's like a, it's supported by this GUI, so we can actually watch our training update in real time, which is very very nice. Um, it's fairly fast. Um, I'll say that like most of the models that I train are actually a little bit slower um, outside of runway um, than than they are in runway. So runway can be like pretty quick. Um, it takes you know. I would say it takes six to eight hours to do like a, a decent length of training time. Um, that would probably be like 12 hours um, or a little bit longer for, for me outside of runway. Um, the price is comparable. So the, the difficult thing is that if you read uh, style GAN materials outside of runway, um, the way that they map uh, the length of time it takes to do training is a little different. So they don't talk about things in steps. Um, they talk about things in terms of ticks and they're slightly different um, so trying to like figure out how long it actually is uh, to train between those two can be a little tricky. Um, but in general, Runway is like a very like good place to start training um, your first models. Um, one thing I'll note in Runway is that they do have sort of a time limit um, in that, uh, and we'll look at this in just a minute, um, as you train a model um, or when a model is finished training, uh, your very last trained model file um, will basically be available as long as you want but there are other model files and sort of the process as you go through that step, um, those will be deleted after two weeks. So if you want any like mid middle of your training set steps, um, you wanna download those. And I'll show you how to do that in just a minute, but you wanna make sure you download those before that two weeks is over or you will lose them. Um, now, a lot of people don't really need those files, um, but there are some examples where you might wanna use them, um, but it's pretty rare, but I still recommend that you, know, you maybe download a couple just to make sure that um, you don't lose all that work. Um, so we talked a little bit about costs. So just be aware that like um, the cost of training um, is half a cent a step. Um, the minimum that I recommend training something for is like 3000 steps. So that's $15. Um, in general, I usually recommend that people train stuff for about 6,000 steps. That'll generally give you a good idea of what your model can look like. So that'll be $30. Um, you can train for as long as a model for as long as you want. The hope is that the longer you train for it, the better it gets. Um, that's not always true. And in general, I find in, the, like, in that first 6,000 steps, you'll see a ton of progress. And then after that, you'll see sort of like details and other things being updated. So. Um, you could train this for 20,000 steps um, and that would be uh, good, but you won't see a lot of change in those last 10,000 steps, I'd say. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but just, be, just know that like, you can train these for a very, very long time, but uh, you get diminishing returns over a certain period of time. Um, now, one thing to note is that you do need a creator plan. Um, I have, I reached out to Chris, who is the founder of Runway. I think he's gonna give everyone, if you can't currently access training, um, I think he's gonna turn on something in your account. Um, if not today, then definitely this week. So if you currently don't see training as an option, um, just let me know and I can make sure that your account gets switched on. Um, this is so that you don't have to pay for the creator plan for this class. Um, but I would say if you're gonna do training and you like like the process, um, paying for a creator plan is like a fairly good deal. It's $15 a month, but you also get like a bonus credits. Um, so as you add, add more credits, sort of like the MTA where it's like you add more credits and if you pay for like $20 in credits, you get like an additional like $5 or 250 or something um, back to your plan. So it does sort of pay for itself. You're gonna use this a lot. Um, yeah, just be aware that like you do need um, 
at some point, maybe after this class is over, you will need like to buy a plan if you want to keep doing training. Um, so there's a whole video here that will go through the entire process. Um, basically doing live demos is always a little iffy. Uh, this is a nice clean demo if you want to go through it. We'll go through a live demo in this class just because I want everyone to sort of see how I run through things. Um, but if you are interested, this is probably the video to watch um, at, la at a later point. Um, they make lots of updates to Runway all the time. So there's always like little things that change a little bit. So this one might be a little out of date, but it'll still cover most of the process you want to go through. Um, but we'll walk through the entire uh, training process in just a minute as well. Um, cool, so the steps for, for training inside of Runway um, are you're gonna upload your data set to Runway. So basically you'll just drag in your data set of images. Um, those will get uploaded to uh, Runway. Um, we'll look at how to do pre-processing. Um, in this step, but you can basically do pre-processing. So if you haven't already cropped all your images to square, you can do some inside of Runway. Um, it's sort of up to you if you want to use Runway's tools or if you want to use some of the tools that I recommended from last week. Um, in general, if you have like 500 images, doing pre-processing on Runway is probably fine. If you have 3,000 images, I don't recommend going through those one by one inside of Runway. You can, um, but it's probably going to take you a while. Um, so that's sort of probably what I would look at. I think the you know, I'm biased because I wrote the tools for the data set tools library, but I generally find them a little bit easier to use um, at a lot, if you have a lot of images at scale. Um, but I also think the runway tools are like fairly decent and like for a lot of what we're doing, which is just testing some examples, um, they work pretty well. Once you're done finishing pre-processing um, your data set, then you're going to want to pick the transfer model you, you are training from. Um, this is where I, differ a little bit from how Runway works. Runway will recommend transfer models based on content. I recommend transfer models based on resolution. Um, in my experience, the difference uh, of translating from content that doesn't match up, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, it'll be a little bit clearer when we actually go through it. Um, in my experience, the transfer from content um, isn't really that different. So we'll, we'll be training from faces in most of our examples, um, but the difference between transferring from faces versus birds not that different, but what is important is that the faces model gives you the highest resolution possible. Um, and that's why I tend to tend to train from it. Um, so usually most models have resolutions of 1024 by 1024, 512 by 512, or 256 by 256. So most of them are square. There are some, like a very a small handful of, of data sets inside of Runway that you can transfer from that are like 360 by 256. So there are some rectangles. The problem is they tend to be pretty small. Um, so again, some of this is like, what sort of resolution do you want as the output? Um, for most of us, because we're, you know, image folks, we want the highest resolution possible. Um, so we have to sort of like figure, we have to sort of like balance out those, those tasks. Um, one thing to know is that the, the higher the resolution, the longer training takes. So if you train a 256 by 256 model, it'll go pretty fast. The problem is that you're stuck with 256 by the end. So kind of can kind of, it's again, a sort of up to you what you want to do. Um, it's a balance of like time, testing, how much money you want to spend, that sort of thing. Um, once you've sort of picked the transfer model, which I actually think is like probably the most confusing and hardest part, um, you will pick a training link. So it's how many steps you do. Um, I think Runway defaults to 3000 steps. I personally like, would recommend setting it a little bit higher than that, like 5,000 or 6,000. But uh, you can also do a, do a, a training for 3,000 steps and then do another 3,000 steps. So sometimes you can also train for a short period of time, just sort of see if you think it's turning out the way you expect it to. And if it looks good, you can keep training again after that. Um, and I'll show how to do that, some of that um, as well. Um, then you're gonna run the training. The training can take anywhere from an hour to eight hours. Um, and that's just the time it takes to process based on resolution based on how long of a training you're doing, um, how many images are in your data set, a couple other things like that. Um, everyone likes to watch it train. Uh, this is like a watching the, the water boil or whatever. Um, many people for your first training, you'll sit there and like, you know, anxiously watch it change. It's up to you. That's totally fine if that's what you want to do. I tend to check on my model about every hour. Um, I've pretty much never really seen runway models like, um, not work like in general they always like i've never seen it's they used to like back in the day when they first started training um within runway there there would be some crashes i don't see crashes happen nearly as much so in general you know checking every hour is just to sort of like keep an eye on it make sure it's not like 
if you set a training for like 10,000 steps um, and you get really far into it, or like if you get 2,000 steps into it and you're like, this isn't looking good, you might want to stop it. Um, but I actually think that they, I don't know if they give you your money back. So it's almost like there's really no reason to stop a training. Once you've set it up, I think you're paying for it. So um, just be aware of that. But sometimes if something does fail, um, you might want to reach out to the, to the Slack team or to the team on Slack. Um, I pretty rarely see things fail anymore, but um, it might happen. And if that, if that does, let me know. Um, and we can also check with the Slack, uh, the, the Runway Slack folks, um, just to sort of see if something, they have all the logs on their end. So if they, if they find something went wrong, um, usually they'll refund you if there was an issue on their end. Um, and then once we finally have a model, then we can do the fun stuff of testing, generating videos, that sort of thing. We'll cover a little bit of that in this class, but we'll mostly um, cover more of that next week. All right, so um, why don't we just, let's, let's dive into actually doing a training. So I'll walk through the steps of this. Um, I think it'll probably take about 30 minutes for us to go through all the steps and have me talk about all the little details. So we'll, we'll do that and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about some of the things to keep an eye on um, and to watch out for, as well as like some other things to learn about um, as we go through this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and open up Runway here. Um, so let's just quit and reopen. So when you come into Runway, um, the way you want to do training is you just want to click on train. And then for us, we're going to use the generative image model. So we'll go ahead and click on this. And you want to give your uh, model a name. So we're going to call this uh, SSHH demo. Great. Uh, so now many of you will not have this many data sets. Clearly, I do a lot of training in here. Um, but you will have uh, sort of a select your data set, right? Some, you will usually have um, some pre-installed data sets. So you'll have, I believe, mountains, airplanes, graffiti, forests, skyscrapers, caterpillars, and nebulas. So you're welcome to use those. Again, um, most of you have already scraped your own data sets. So you should probably like use those. Um, the way to upload a data set is just to press the plus button here. And then you're going to go and find your data set. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and grab the Michelle Heslop, um, which is the data set that we scraped a little bit of from Instagram last week. Um, now this is probably going to take a little bit of time to upload. I've already uploaded it. It's already here. So I'm actually going to cancel, but this will upload. Um, one thing I recommend is that if you have a good chunk of images and they're all PNGs, you might want to convert them to like, um, like high compression or like, like 90% or 100% JPEGs. Um, just because uploading, like you actually see here, like this was, um, these are all PNGs. So 722 PNGs is about two gigabytes. Uh, 4,500 JPEGs is like less than a gigabyte. So just be aware of file size. Like this is gonna be really slow to upload. Um, so I'm gonna cancel this and we're just gonna work from this. Um, but just be aware that like how big your data set is can affect how slow it is to upload. Um, there used to be a cap on how big your uploads could be in Runway. I think it was like two gigabytes. Um, so if you have a ton of images and they're all PNGs, you might run into that issue. I don't know if they've removed that cap yet. Um, I know I ran into it for a while there. Um, so just be aware that like in general, if you can like batch process um, into JPEGs, that's probably gonna be better for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and cancel this um, because I already have my data set up here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is once you've uploaded it, you can just go ahead and click on your data set. Um, so now on the right hand side here is where we get to preview our data set, right? So this is gonna show us all the images that I've uploaded. And under here is a step called pre-process. Um, if you haven't already cropped all your images to square, I do recommend like just taking a look at this. So we're gonna go ahead and press the pre-process. Um, what is happening is it's now gonna load in all of these images into this window. And I'm gonna be able to edit this, um, edit all of my images here. So again, I don't really recommend doing this in Runway um, because we have other tools available to us. But if you do just wanna, if you didn't like the data sets tool or you're not a command line person, you can edit stuff here. Um, so the way this works is like, you've got all of your images here along the left-hand side. Um, so I can go ahead and like crop these um, to whatever I want. So the center crop is what, what I think will default happen. Um, so if you just hit center crop, you'll sort of see like, okay, that's what it's cropped this to. Now I can change this by stretching this out a little bit or moving this around. So you can sort of move these. Um, I don't think you can 
Yeah, so it's always gonna, it's gonna maintain its square aspect ratio. It used to not do that, but it's good that it does do that. So yeah, so this is only for squares. Um, so again, remember that for style GAN, um, in 90% of cases, you're gonna want a square image. So you can go through here. Um, when you like this one, uh, you can go ahead and press submit. It gets added over here. What's gonna happen is once you've run through all of these, um, you can sort of play with things. There is also this auto crop feature. This is actually using a machine learning model. Um, and it tries to figure out the best crop for images. So let me see if I can find one here that I think maybe would work well with an auto crop. This image might, because I think what it's gonna to try to do is it's gonna to try to auto crop around um, the shape it's aware of. I have no idea how long this is gonna take, we'll see. Okay, so that's what I decided is the auto crop. Um, you know, depending on the source you have, my guess is it's gonna to try to crop around faces or gonna try, try to crop around other images. Um, I don't know how, uh, I don't know how well it works. So try it, see if it works for you or your data set. Um, but again, there's also this random crop feature which will just uh, sort of randomize your, your crops, uh, crop size. Um, but again, so here again, we could sort of come in and just sort of say, I just want this size, or I just wanna focus on this object. Um, I could do this for every one of these images. Um, one thing to note is that you'll see that this image is now 567 by 567. If I try to use this with the 1024 by 1024 model, all Runway will do is it'll blow up the image to 1024 by 1024. Um, and I think it'll just use like linear interpolation rather than like a machine learning super resolution model. So it might get a little blurry. So if you're like have a bunch of small images and you're cropping in on them even further, you might end up with blurry artifacts on the output. So just be aware of that. Um, this is why generally like I'll just leave these as large as I can, um, but try to maybe move these around to get the best crop. You can also, um, you can select all of these, I believe. So you can select all your uncropped and you can just do like a random crop. Um, I think by default, you there's also an option if you don't pre-process all of your images to just say run all of them as random crops. You don't need to do this step. This step is optional. Um, but if you don't do this step of like manually saying, hey, I want this crop, um, Runway will default, like let you choose an option for all your images. So uh, just know this is optional. Like if you wanna just do a random crop on everything, don't do it this way, just in your settings. Like actually, I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm gonna uncheck this and I'm just gonna say submit. Um, and it's gonna process our data set a little bit more. Um, it's actually gonna come, it's actually gonna duplicate it. So this might, this might also take some time. Um, so we'll sort of see how this goes. Um, but yeah, so don't, I would recommend if you're just gonna run a random crop on all your images, don't, don't use the pre-processing tool. The pre-processing tool is there if you're like, I wanna I have a specific crop I wanna do for every image or like a batch of images. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, so I'm gonna let this, oh, actually, you know what? This is running pretty quickly. So I'm just gonna wait one minute and see when this finishes. Uh, question, Derek. Yeah. Um, any advantage or disadvantage to like, uh, so a couple of sets I had, they were rectangle images and I just cropped out the space on the right and left to square it up. Uh, is that like something that should be avoided or I, I remember you saying last week that straight lines aren't really handled too well by runway. Um, yeah. So there is a bunch of techniques around like, prepping data sets. So if you have a rectangle, um, let's say it's a face and you really wanna keep that face in its, in its shape, you might um, wanna just add white edges. Those white edges will be kind of fuzzed out as it runs through the model, but that is one technique. Another way is to, um, so in the case of these models where actually I have, um, let, me, let me pull up some of the images for these really quickly. Um, so if you actually look at some of these images, so some of these images are square, right? But they're also abstract. So I, I actually, there's a script inside the dataset tools library that does a, a square crop from the bottom and then also does a square crop from the top. So you actually get two images for one. Um, now the problem with a lot of these ab abstract things is that it, it's gonna get, it's gonna get what I call soupy and I'll show you an example of what happened with this one, which is it got soupy. Um, it just doesn't know all the shapes, so it tries to like, do its best guess and it doesn't work as well as you would like. Um, so this is a technique you can do with abstract images, right? But if you have a, a photo of a person, you don't necessarily wanna do a crop of a top of a head and a bottom of a head. Um, so it just really depends on the data set. Um, so in some cases you might just wanna add white borders. Um, one of the techniques that a lot of folks are doing that are like in the more like high-end professional style again is they're actually just stretching all the images. 
Um, so you stretch them all to 1024, and then when you do outputs, you stretch them back down. Now that assumes that they all have the exact same proportion. Um, if they don't, you're going to get wonky ones. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different techniques to doing this. And I think as you play with them, you'll, you'll start to get a better feel for what works and what doesn't. Um, but yeah, any of these techniques are fine. Um, and they all just end up like influencing the data set a little bit. Um, but it's sort of up to you. But I would definitely say if you have rectangular images, think about what you want to do with those rectangles, because quite often just center cropping them isn't the right solution. Um, so this is a case of where like runway doesn't allow you an option to actually like add borders. Um, so you actually want to add those borders before uploading your data set to this model, right. because okay. otherwise it will yeah. crop center. Yeah. I did some like some batch scripting in Photoshop yep. to, to do that, to like square them up a bit. But, yep. That uh, works okay, too. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like this is set up here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this model and we'll work off this one. There's only two images different between this one and this one, but um, we can go ahead and work off this. Okay, so now this is basically the most important step. Um, and Runway has added a new little feature here, which is that they have said presets. Um, and they are saying, you know, what do you, what best describes your data set and what do you wanna pick from this? This is not how I would do it. Um, this is my personal opinion. And based on some feedback that I've seen with from a bunch of other StyleGAN people, this is not really the, the right way to, to approach this. Um, it makes sense logically that if you have a bunch of, um, say, other illustrated animals, you might want to build off illustrations. The problem is I believe this, these, these data sets are not all um, the same resolution, right? So the faces data set is 1024 by 1024. That's basically what you want to go with because it's the highest resolution. This car model, I believe, is like 256 by 320 or something. So again, it's small, but it's rectangular. So like generating off of these is not really the way that I would approach this personally. Um, so these are presets. What I actually recommend you doing is click on advanced. And then you have an event of a type of architecture option. Um, you don't ever Really, you don't want StyleGAN 1. StyleGAN 1 is old. Um, it leads to lower resolution or like less realistic images. Um, I definitely recommend StyleGAN 2. And then you have an option of a pre-chain model here. So what I recommend doing is clicking change. And along the bottom here are a bunch of options. So 90% of the time, I would recommend that you choose faces. Um, faces is 1024 by 1024. Um, it is an official NVIDIA model, which you don't need to worry about. Basically, that means it's like very well trained. Um, but if you are looking for other things here, like for example, all of your previously trained models will be down here. So you can also pick a, a previously trained model you did. So this would be a good way if you want to continue training, you could pick your previous model and train on top of it. Or if you're just like, well, I've got this other abstract image model I want to train from. So let me just pick this and like build on top of it, right? That's also an option. But you have to remember that did you train this one at 1024 by 1024 as well? Um, so I think when you select this, yeah, it doesn't really tell you what size you have. So when you click mountains, again, they don't really tell you what images or what size these are. So if you, oh, here it is. So if you hover over the little eye icon, it'll tell you the resolution. So this is five, so the cars model is 512 by 384. So bigger than I said it was, but it's still rectangular and it's still smaller than 1024 by 1024. Um, so again, this is why I don't recommend their version of like train based on what you are already looking for. Um, the truth is uh, transfer learning, which we'll talk about in, in a little more detail after I do this demo, transfer learning works no matter what model you use. You might just have like an extra 250 steps or something to train. Uh, that is the difference between faces or cats, right? So if you are training dogs, your intuitive sense says, well, I should train off cats, right? Because they're both animals. Um, but the problem is that this cat's model is 256 by 256. Um, so you can train dogs off of faces um, and get 1024 by 1024. And you have to do a little bit more work. The model has to learn a little bit more um, detail in order to get to dogs. But you get 1024 by 1024 out of it. So it's worth it to use this um, for that reason alone. So this is where I don't, I don't like how Runway sets it up. This is how I would approach it. Um, if you want to play, play around with it and see how different they really are, feel free to try that. Um, but in my experience, choosing the resolution is fine. Like just based on our resolution, it's more important. It's like arguably more important than, than any of the features you have. So for this version, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to choose faces. Um, this tends to be the one that I work with uh, the most. Um, now, before I hit start training, there's two other things I want to look at. I want to look at my pre-processing options, and then I want to look at training steps. So as I mentioned, um, if you just want a random crop, 
Uh, it does not matter. You don't have to do pre-processing and just select random crop here. There's also a center crop option, um, which will, you know, again, crop to the center. So if you have rectangulars, re uh, rectangular images, it's going to crop from the tops and bottoms. If you have a horizontal rectangular, it's going to crop from the sides. Um, no crop. I don't, I would assume no crop uh, is still going to do some cropping if you have rectangular images. Maybe, I've actually never played with this. Maybe this is where it adds edges or borders. I don't know. Maybe I've actually never tried this before, um, but I assume that even if you set no crop, there'll probably be some cropping because you can't just give it rectangular images and have it be done. So I don't actually know what no crop does. Let's see. Uh, oh, see, so for no crop, each image will be resized to fit to the one to one square aspect ratio. So I think that means it's still gonna crop. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is again, because this is a little opaque, um, this is why I generally recommend uh, doing all of your pre-processing before you send it to runway, just because you don't, then you know exactly what's going to happen, right? You can go through every image and see what 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 you did to change it. Whereas here, uh, you might you won't actually see what images you're sending to the model, um, so it's a little bit of a guesswork about what's what's actually going on there. Um, so we'll leave this at actually we can do random crop because these are pretty randomized images. Um, it doesn't matter where the crop comes from, so we'll set that to random. And then the last thing is steps. So the steps it defaults to three thousand. Um, I believe you can go as low as one thousand. I don't think you can go lower than that. Let me see. I guess you can go to 500. Um, some of these, like, it's really not worth training anything. Like, I would put everything in steps to 1,000. Um, there's really going to be such minor differences between anything less than 1,000 steps. Like, um, if you set it between 100 steps, it's like really, there's not going to be any difference of a change. So, st start at 1,000, so 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. I generally, if it's a brand new training, I'm generally gonna set it to 5,000 or 6,000, just because I know that, that those tend to work really well. And like, um, we'll look at what happens when you train something a little bit too too short of a period of time um, versus a longer period of time. Um, but in general, I think 5,000 to 6,000 is good for a new model. Um, plus you'll still get those other steps. Now, if you just wanna play it safe, you can do a 3,000, uh, train it for that long, see how the results are. And if you like it, you can train another 3,000 and you'll get to 6,000. Um, so it's sort of up to you how you approach it. I'm sort of just like, I like to do it all in one big batch because I just know how long I usually like a model to train for. That's usually 6,000 steps. Um, I actually did this one. I trained this one previously at a 10,000 steps um, and I still got super results, which means it's really more, really more of a model problem than it, or really more of a data set problem than it is a training period time problem. Um, we'll talk about some of that uh, in a minute. So I'm gonna set this to 5,000 steps for this model. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and hit start training. So when you hit start training, um, it's gonna take a couple minutes just to get warmed up. Basically it has to spin up a server behind the scenes. It has to process your data set and convert it into a format that um, StyleGAN takes. So usually about 10 to 15 minutes, you'll just see this screen. Um, and at some point you will get a screen that says, hey, we're starting to train. So um, while this runs, uh, let me show you what a finished training looks like um, and how you can sort of like look at it and, and see how it's working. Um, so this will take 10 to 15 minutes. We'll look at it again um, after our break, uh, just sort of see the process of it, of it starting up. Um, so here are, uh, this is one of my finished uh, models. So this is the one I trained for 10,000 steps. Um, and actually, let me go to my models, actually go to my, my training, I believe. So let's see here. Completed, so I wanna go look at this one. Um, so when a model is finished, you will get a page that looks like this, which is the review page. Um, we'll say, hooray, you've trained a model. Um, it'll tell you how many uh, checkpoints, or the checkpoint is basically like the point at which it saved out the model. So the current selected checkpoint is step 10,000, which is this train for 10,000 steps. Um, if you wanna change that, and actually let me just show you. So basically like when you're done, I think the, the most, the best recommend recommendation I have is to click up here in training and you will get an image that looks like this. And this is a slider. So this slider will show you how many steps you've trained for, right? So this is 10, step 10,000. If you crank it all the way back to zero, you'll see this is what I trained the data set on. So this is transfer learning. I'll talk a little bit more about this process, but I trained off this data set, right? So it's still abstract images. Um, and then you can slowly scrub across and it will sort of show you how they change over time. So you'll see for this particular model, like uh, one, it's already abstract to begin with. So it's like kind of, 
difficult to tell like how it's doing, um, but you will see it change over time. Um, now, personally, I felt like this didn't look exactly the way the data set did. Um, so I was a little, I was personally just disappointed in this. It didn't really give me the textures I was looking for, which is fine. It happens. Um, I think this data set was just too diverse overall. So I think this is, again, this question of diversity. Um, if we actually go back and look at this data set, there's so many different types of images, right? There's like a bunch of these very like swirly abstracts. There's ge geometric images. Um, as we get later in the data set, I think there is like, um, you know, more like geometric floral stuff. Like I think it's just, this one just ended up being way too diverse. Um, and I could probably go back and like sort of simplify it um, and maybe do like, you know, take a hundred of these images that look more similar and maybe do some random cropping to get more of those textures out of it. Um, so I might actually try that again and I, we can look at those results next week and sort of see if it, it made it better. Um, but this is a common thing you'll see is that like, You'll start and you'll train something and be like, that wasn't what I was expecting to see. And they have to go back and sort of figure out how do I manipulate my data set to get more in the direction of what I want. Um, a cool thing you can do here is you can do this create progress video. So you click this progress video button. Um, let's see if we get our video here. This is just like a fun video to upload um, to like Twitter or Instagram. Like people are always like, oh, how did you do this? Um, and this will basically show you um, what what the process of training over that period of time was. So a lot of times when you pick faces, you'll see like the faces like sort of dissolve into weirdness and then out comes your data set. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing to look at. Um, I definitely recommend playing with it and generating it one just to sort of see what happens. Um, still processing. All right, we'll come back to that. Um, let me go back over there. So um, this sort of helps you sort of see what steps you have. So what I recommend doing is maybe playing with this. Some, something you might find is that you like, you know, you don't like step 10,000, but you do like step 5,000. Um, and one thing that that sort of means is that you might want to change your, your checkpoint to that 5,000 step. So if we go back to review and we click on this change down here. You, you can change your steps. Um, you can change them in 500 increments. So again, like if you really like step like 88, 20, you can't change to that, um, but you might be able to change to 9,000 or 8,500. Um, so what you can do here is you can come down and you can hover over your step and click on the little ellipses menu here and you can click set as default. You can also download. So again, this is where I recommend um, you have 14 days to download anything that isn't your default checkpoint. So if you train something for a really long time, I might recommend just downloading a couple of these steps. So, you know, some people have fun downloading sort of the step 1000 or step 500 where it's like, especially if you train off faces, you've got some really creepy, weird looking faces that are training. So you might want to download this. Um, and I just uploaded a video on how to bring these back into runway, but you might want to download this model. Um, so you have it, so you have it available to you. Um, because runway after 14 days will delete any of them that aren't labeled default. And you only have one marked as default to start with. So just be aware of that. Um, in most cases, the default will be your latest trained version and that is fine. Um, that will totally work for you. Um, for most folks, that's, that's pretty much all you need and that's why they end up deleting all the other files. Um, but if you do wanna keep any, I recommend um, you know, downloading them. You can also edit the name of it. So if you wanna view or edit, you can say like, you know, for whatever reason, if you want to like say like more faces or less faces, you can edit the name here um, and have that show up in your checkpoint. Um, a couple other cool features that you can do directly from the review page of a finished model is it generates a random latent walk uh, video. So again, if you just want to like quickly share your results on Twitter, or Instagram, or wherever, um, you can come over here and click save video. Um, this is a randomized video. So um, you'll, you know, obviously we'll look at this a little bit later in class, but like you can control this a lot more, but it does generate sort of one of these videos for you to download and like sort of have fun with. Um, another way, another thing you can do is you can batch export a number of images. Um, so if say you have, you know, you like this model and you just want to like batch export a bunch of images to sort of see what happens, you can generate those from here. Um, I believe it's, I think there's a minimum you can do. I think, yeah, the minimum is 50 and the maximum is a thousand. Um, so if you just want to generate like 50 like representative images of your model, you can go ahead and generate these from here. Um, so you just press generate. We can also do this from our model once our model, uh, once we've added it to a workspace. Um, but it's kind of nice that you can do it all directly from here. So um, just take a look at that. Um, and these will all be saved to your assets folder. So if you go to assets, 
our training image video, our, our like sort of process video is done. And now it's generating um, your image experiments. One nice thing that I will say about the exports is that exports tend to be cheaper than going through and picking out your own in a workspace. So the exports, I think, are something on the level of like one cent per image, um, whereas like, you know, it's five cents per minute to run the model. Um, so if you just want to generate a bunch of random images, um, it is helpful to sort of just generate a bunch through there. Uh, one of the problems is that if you generate an image you like, uh, it's, you can't reverse engineer what, uh, what seed value that was. So you can't go back and like, oh, now I want to interpolate from this image to this image. So just be aware that like it has its downfalls. Um, if you just want to generate a bunch of random images, it's fun to see, um, but you can't really do much with it, right? So here, here we can download this, but basically the images are done. So like, this is all you can do with these images um, until you, uh, it's really, so there's not much else you can do. Um, this is just a bunch of random images. It's still pretty cool. Um, like I can look at these and sort of see what happened. Like some of these are pretty realistic compared to what the data set was. Um, but what I was hoping for was more of those like textured patterns. I didn't get any of those. Um, so clearly, you know, it's interesting, but it didn't match really my expectations of this. All right, so that is pretty much everything you can do from inside of your training session. Um, the last thing that you want to do is these models will now show up in your My Models folder. But let's just say you want to play with this immediately. Like you can go ahead and go add to, work, add to workspace. And this is going to add it to your workspace. And here's where you can then um, utilize the vector input um, and start to review these. Um, you know, so you can start to explore this model a little bit more in more detail inside of your workspace. this guy run for a little bit more. Cool, so now I can start to see um, more of my models here. Um, it has this very like, like a, these are like watercolor stones that are like stacked on top of each other or something. I'm gonna refresh and see if there's, yeah, so this is a little bit easier to see all the diversity here. So, I mean, I do like being able to bring a model into this interface to sort of explore, you know, what's happening here. Maybe I want to crank up my sampling distance to sort of see how diverse these things are. And again, I can download these one by one, sort of picking on, jump, like clicking on one and then clicking download. Um, it's just going to save that image. I can click on another one, save that image down. Um, so this is a different way of, um, of course, um, so this is just a different way of downloading images. And this one's probably a little bit slower, but I have a little bit more control over the images I'm picking. Um, so just be aware of that. Cool, so that was walking through just the training process. Um, after our break, I've got a couple little more things to, to think about or keep an eye on as you do the training. Um, but are there any questions about uh, the training process that we just walked through? I had a quick question from the, when we're talking about cropping, is it possible to put uh, an image just on a 1024 by 1024 background and then export it like that, kind of centered, but just so it has the dimensions it needs to have? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's certainly one way to work. Uh, the other way to work is that there are some tools inside the data set tool library that will stretch the edges or just like put it on a white background or you can choose the color of your borders. So you could also use that tool as well um, if you're interested in it. I think I have a video on that, but if you, if you need help, let me know and I can send over the command to do that as well. Um, I tend to find that that works fairly well. Um, in terms of borders, there's also the option of like, and I think I talked about this maybe a little bit with Bone Bone, you can also like reflect the edges. So if you have an image where like, maybe you, you want all the pixels, like you, you can reflect the edges a little bit, um, depending on the, the shape and size of the image. And that will almost fake it so it looks like it, it stretches to the edges. Um, and that's sort of a nice technique if you don't want those hard white lines in, in your data set or in your output model. Any other questions? Cool, okay, so let's do this. So let's take, um, let's actually take an eight minute break. I have a little bit more to do after class, but not too much. So why don't we come back at 10 after um, and we'll, we'll keep going on this. Cool, all 
All right, see everybody in eight minutes. All right, cool, welcome back. Um, any questions uh, that came to you during the break about training or anything? Okay, cool. Um, so let's take a look at the training process that's been going on for a couple minutes now. So we'll see over here that um, we've been training for a little bit. It looks like we're at 190 steps into our 5,000. Um, so you'll see right now it looks like pretty, pretty much like faces. Um, lots of times people will see this and be like, oh no, my model isn't working right um, because I see faces and my data says not faces. And this is uh, a common response and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. Um, but essentially if you're seeing faces and you start from faces in the transfer process, this is normal. Um, so this is what you should be seeing. Usually I, I find these faces are dissolved or gone um, by about step 1000, um, but you can sort of see the vestiges of them as you scrub through this thing. Um, so a couple other notes is along the right hand side here. Um, you'll see our status is still training. Um, I'm gonna skip over FID score and come back to that. You'll see steps, so we're uh, 220 steps into our 5000. And the uh, approximate time that's gonna to take to finish training this is about eight hours. I think that's probably a little high, but we'll see. Um, so eight hours uh, left training. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll set this up at night, let it train overnight. Um, you don't, you can quit runway. You can actually close all your applications and it'll still start, it'll still be training behind the scenes. Um, I think it sends you an email when it's finished. So, um, you know, you don't have to look at this thing or keep an eye on it. It, it will just sort of go on forever. Um, FID score. So. FID score is a metric that uh, StyleGAN comes packaged with. The idea is that the lower your score is, the better your training results are. Um, and in fact, if you hover over this, you'll see it says something like uh, the Frechet Inception Distance Score measures the visual similarity between the generated images in the model and the images from the original data set. Um, so the lower your score, the better your images are to the original, the closer the generated images are to the original images. Um, so lots of people have questions about FID score. Many people are worried about like, why isn't my FID score lower? Um, my main response is don't worry too much about your FID score. Um, there's a lot of things that go into this scoring number. Um, one is that uh, if your images that you're trying to output to should be abstract, this score will not be good. Um, this score sort of bases it on um, the inception distance score is a thing called the inception data set or the inception network, which means it's largely trained on objects. So if you are making a data set of dogs or cats or other like well-known objects, your FID score might be clearer and, and, and better match what the um, input is. But a lot of times your FID score will like not it'll hit like 100 or something even worse than that. And you'll be like, oh, this isn't, this clearly isn't a good model. And that's not really like what FID score stands for. So in general, I would say like, don't worry about your FID score. In fact, if we go back to um, the model that I trained already, let's go back to one of these. Um, let's look at uh, this one. And if I go to training here, um, so you'll see my ending FID score was 129 and you'll see it's in red because that's bad. Um, but if you scroll back all the way to the beginning, you'll see my FID score started at 220. So it clearly got better over time, right? Like this is, this is, this is a good thing that the score lowered. Um, now, if I run, run this for another 10,000 steps, my guess is it's, it might drop to 100, but it's never going to go much lower than that. Whereas if I have a, a data set of like the bone bone, which is like cat images, um, I bet the cat images I could get down to like 40 or 50 as a score. Um, so just be aware that like FID score is important, but like don't don't overthink it. And also like don't try to like scrub between like where did I get my lowest FID score? Was it here? Was it here? It's like it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so I see a lot of people who like spend hours fretting over their FID score not being low enough, and it's just it's not that serious. Um, and it depends a lot on the data set you're using. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, it's good to sort of see that your data set your FID score is going down. I would say. Um, there may be a case of where your FID score is going down um, and then it like spikes and it keeps going up. That is a sign of something and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but essentially like as long as your data set is like 
your FAD score is like slowly going down or plateaus, that's fine. So um, just be aware of that. Um, lots of people spend way too much time worrying about that score, but in general, it's just there as like a guidance. It's not like a metric of your actual data set and how good it is or whatever it is. So just be aware of that. Um, cool, so let me jump back to my slides here really quickly. I think there's a couple other material things I wanna cover just about the training process. Um, so transfer learning. So let's talk a little bit about transfer learning. Um, so transfer learning is this process of when we started the model, we said we wanna start from something else, right? So we wanna start from faces. We wanna start from cats. We wanna start from cars. Um, transfer learning is, this is essentially a process of what we call transfer learning. Um, this is an example of what that looks like, right? So you start with faces and it slowly dissolves into abstract images. Um, so what is transfer learning? So transfer learning is a technique that is fairly common in machine learning. And what it does, it says, I can take a model that has already been really well trained and I can train on top of that. And what that does, is it saves me a ton of time. So um, in the case of something like the faces model, that faces model was trained for a month um, or longer. Um, so it was a very, very long time. Um, for you to train your own model from scratch, which is again, like your logic says, I should train this from scratch, right? It'll be better. Um, that's gonna take you a long time and cost you a lot of money, right? So imagine trying to train a model in runway for a month and how expensive that would be. Um, you don't wanna do that. So this is a way of us basically being able to take a model that's already been trained, train on top of it for a, for a little bit of a longer time and getting a new model out of it. Um, the intuition here is that, um, let's say that, um, how do I describe this? This is like a, this is like teaching someone a foreign language, right? So let's say that I want to teach you, or uh, to to speak French, um, and you know you spend years um, learning French and you learn all the different conjugations, all the different rules of it, and your your test is like, give me a French sentence or a French paragraph. Um, now the thing is like what you're seeing is like this final output of like a sentence or a paragraph, but what you learned behind the scenes is all this other stuff. So this is sort of what happens with these models is that even though they're being trained to, to output faces, they've also learned a bunch of other things about what faces aren't or what other structures look like as they're training. So what we're doing when we leverage transfer learning is we're taking all those underlying learnings and being able to apply our new stuff on top of it. Um, and what we've actually found or like I shouldn't say we, because I didn't do this work. The, the people who made uh, the StyleGAM model um, just recently reported that a transfer learned model um, actually has a higher FID score, or a better FID score, a lower FID score in this case, um, than, a, than a model trained from scratch. So even when you take these, you're actually learning, there's, there's stuff sort of hidden in this network that knows more than a, one, than a model trained from scratch. So um, lots of people are like, oh, I want to train from scratch. Like I want it to be perfect from the beginning. And it actually turns out that's not true. Um, transfer learning is actually a better process. And it saves you time and it saves you money. And if you care about the climate, uh, you know GPUs are like really shitty for the world because they burn through a lot of energy. So we're also like saving, saving the world while, while doing this stuff. So um, shouldn't say it's saving the world. You're still doing some bad things with energy use. But anyway, um, in general, just transfer learning is a better process. So like embrace it. Um, again, people worry too much about like, should I be training from faces? Should I be training from cats? In my experience, it's again, maybe 500 steps difference to erase what was there previously. Um, so pick by resolution, that's just my recommendation. Um, but transfer learning is pretty cool. Like what I will say is a lot of people love um, this sort of step, right? So there's this weird step in here where like, um, you've got people's faces with these like weird textures and patterns, right? So this might be step 500 or step 1000. Lots of people will like to build off this model and like just sort of show weird looking human faces. Um, and similarly, if you train off of one of your previous models, you get sort of this cool like blended technique of, of images. Um, so there are actually a lot of people who will just generate models doing this to like get this sort of weird texture transfer process. Um, so, you know, embrace the fact that it's weird, show all your friends all the weird stuff you're making um, using this step, um, but don't worry about like, you know, oh, how are the faces affecting this final thing? Because you can kind of see, if you scrub through this, um, you can kind of see how people's faces are changing over time, right? Like the hair is still there, and like by the time it finally disappears, it's like you can kind of see where it's still coming from. Um, so this is kind of the fun or like the cool part of transfer learning, um, but just know in general transfer learning is like a totally fine process to go through. I mentioned this before, but FID scores really don't matter. Use them as a reference. Don't 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 worry about them as an absolute. Um, most of the stuff we'll be training on will not show really really great FID scores. Um, 
I think the FID score for that faces model was like five. So like, you're never gonna get that low, right? Um, so don't try to like be like, I need to get this down to zero for it to be finished. Um, anything lower than where it started is technically better, um, but every model will have its own sort of equilibrium where it, where it bottoms out. All right, so a couple of things to watch out for when, you're, when you are doing trainings. Um, overfitting. So overfitting will probably be one of the more common things that we see, um, especially if you're working with a small data set. Um, overfitting is essentially that your generated images look almost exactly like your data set images, but in a bad way. Like they've almost like copied them directly. Um, this is what we call overfitting. It is essentially the model copies what you've done. Um, it memorizes the training set. Um, and, and it does this thing what we call, it doesn't generalize. So generalize is what we really want, right? We want the model to have a general idea of how faces are shaped or a general idea of like eyes always come in these five colors, um, hair comes in these, you know, thousands of textures, um, faces come in these sort of skin colors, that sort of thing. That's a generalization. Um, if I were to upload 20 images of different faces and only 20, uh, it's very likely that this model would overfit to just those 20 faces. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is an example of a model that overfit. So basically, I scraped a bunch of um, images of uh, screens and cell phones and whatever off Amazon. And I really only had like about 100 um, when I was done. And when I trained it, you can sort of see that like, in many cases, it's duplicating images, right? So this image looks exactly like this image, looks exactly like this image. Um, you know, it looks like there's this hand with the phone where even though it's flipped left to right, it's still sort of the exact same image in many cases. Um, this is a good way to see if things are overfitting. Another good way is to actually generate a latent video of this. And you see how it jumps, it like bounces between things. That's a good example of overfitting. Um, if it were, if it were, it would be a lot smoother of a transition if it didn't overfit, if it were generalized. But again, because I only had so many images of TVs and so many images of phones, um, it didn't really get to a point where I sort of knew that there were modes between those. Um, so this is a good way to quickly tell if you overfit. Um, I will say Runway has a pretty decent setup inside their system where it generally doesn't overfit as much. Um, there's, uh, if you were to see any of my videos from my other classes where we're not using Runway, there are some parameters you can do inside of StyleGAN to try to uh, hold back on being able to overfit. Um, but sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Um, I'll say with the newer StyleGAN, StyleGAN 2, yeah, there's also generally a little bit less of an issue with overfitting. Um, but if you are going with a small number of images, you might catch this overfitting. Um, it's probably likely going to happen if you're under 100 images or not. So just be aware of that. Um, so again, I would also say like overfitting isn't terrible, right? Like if you really like this like glitchy look, um, there's no reason why you couldn't do this. Um, the problem is that you really only have a handful of images that you can work with, right? So like if I were to generate 100 samples of this image or of this model, um, I would get a lot of the same images. And it's sort of like, was that worth $30 in training or $50 in training? Probably not. Um, so again, you sort of have to like balance like, what am I trying to accomplish um, versus how much am I paying for it? Um, you know, so that sort of thing. So in general, I would say like, if you have a very small amount of data, there's not much you can do. Um, so do think about like worrying about overfitting. Um, with Runway, you can just sort of train it and see what happens. Um, again, 30 bucks isn't the end of the world, but it is, you know, a fair amount of money. Uh, usual causes for this are that your image, your data set isn't diverse enough um, or it's not large enough. Um, this is sort of out of date now. Um, I would say minimum should really be 100. Um, this is also something that could happen if you have a lot of duplicates in your images. So if you're scraping, say if you're scraping like um, Amazon or you're scraping... Um, like Google Images for a certain thing, there might be a lot of duplicate images in your data set. So that's where you might want to go in and clean up duplicates. Um, if you have a lot of duplicates, like say you have 300 images, but all of your images are duplicated five or six times, you'll again have a very low diversity in your image data set. So um, there's no real way to fix this other than to get more images in your data set. Um, that's usually the best solution. Um, so if you have a very small data set, you might have to think about how to pad it um, or stretch it a little bit longer. Another common thing you might see with your models, although I see this less and less um, with both StyleGAN, but also um, with uh, Runway, is a thing called mode collapse. Mode collapse is, let's say, um, 
I have a data set that contains cats, dogs, and um, wolves. And when I generate all my images, all I ever see are dogs and wolves, and I never see cats. That's an example of mode collapse. Um, basically, what's happening is that the model has like sort of memorized dogs and wolves, um, and has sort of like forgotten that it needs to figure out how to do cats. Um, so this is something that, that you won't see as much in StyleGAN, or like actually the way you see mode collapse is, is a little different. So let me show an example of this. Well, so this is an example of sort of like how this thing clusters, right? It ends up knowing how to solve for certain clusters of data sets or certain types of images, but not for all of them. Um, this tends not to happen as much with StyleGAN, but it is possible. What I usually see mode collapse happen is something that looks like this. Um, so this almost looks like Again, this almost looks like overfitting, right? In the sense that it's like showing you kind of the same image over and over and over again. But the problem is like, it doesn't look anything like the real image. It just looks like noise or like really blobby shapes. Um, this is a common style gain example of either a mode collapse or this might also be called a, called a gradient explosion. Um, either way, it's like bad in the sense that like what you have are sort of a bunch of same images, um, but it doesn't really uh, look like your data set and it doesn't really reproduce uh, in a good way. Um, so if you generate a bunch of samples and they look sort of like this, this might be an example of mode collapse. Um, similarly, if you generate an animation of this, you'll see this thing where it does this bouncing, right? It like skips between, it like can shift colors a little bit, but then it bounces between things. Um, so I generally like during a, a latent video or a, an animation will sort of help you know if you've got a mode collapse or an overfitting problem. Um, again, I don't see this as much with the runway style GAM, but you used to see this a lot more with the original style GAM. Um, which is yet another reason why I don't recommend using that setting. Um, the good thing about this is that you can retrain it and oftentimes it'll go away. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that is that when you're training, um, sometimes uh, what happens is the, the, the model sort of just runs away. Like it keeps seeing the same images and it sort of gets an idea in its head about like, um, imagine almost like the bank teller going crazy and like he just thinks any, like he thinks like, all a dollar bill has to look like this. It's like a dollar bill from like a crazy foreign country. And so he like kind of goes on a war path of just like, this is a dollar bill, this is a dollar bill. And like, it just sort of gets further and further away from reality. Um, you can sort of start from an earlier training position and restart it. Um, in runway, that basically means retrain it from scratch, but like it, you could do it. Um, yeah, so it, I, I very rarely see it these days in, in style again, but it, it can happen. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about which iteration is best in your model. Um, I often hear people like really obsess over which iteration do I choose, which checkpoint do I choose. Um, so here's an example of a model where like this is step 2260, step 2350, step 2570, step 2660. And like someone is of like, oh, I love the texture on this particular frame. So I want to choose this exact step, right? And the truth is like, looking at steps this close to each other isn't really an accurate way of thinking about how a model trains. Um, the problem with this is like, well, first off inside runway, you can't even use this step, right? Your steps have to be every 500 checkpoint or 500 steps. Um, a checkpoint has to be every 500 steps. So like you don't really even have access to these sort of things. Um, but also like there's lots of little variations that happen as these models just train and obsessing over how one image or a couple images look in your training data or look in your output grid um, isn't necessarily accurate of the entire model. So it's really important to think about this. Actually, what I recommend doing is looking at step things that are almost a thousand or 500 steps apart and choosing between those steps. Um, so if I really want something that looks maybe more like Freya Buckler's work, I wanna choose 5140. If I want something that's more textural and maybe a little bit crazier, I wanna do 2040. Um, so don't like, this is again, like this is a thing where like designers, especially in our perfectionist ways, can like obsess over like little details, like, oh, I want the model to always do this. And it's like not, not always possible that that's actually what's gonna happen. So, you know, save yourself a little bit of time, don't obsess over the details too much in these things and pick between larger gaps or steps inside of these models. Um, because again, like what you see here is representative, this is what, like maybe 20 images of a, of a model that should contain thousands of images. Um, so there could be lots of other good moments in this thing that you're missing by sort of obsessing over individual images in a grid. So just be aware of that. It's something that I've heard fairly frequently from folks and I just like wanna absolve you of your perfectionism. Um, 
you know, just pick from these from these bigger gaps. And of course, remember these are samples. So like, if at the end of the day you're not sure what to do, like you should also go in um, and actually like look at a bigger, wider set of your images. So generate 100 samples, 200 samples. Go into the vector input viewer and look at them there. Um, any questions? This sort of wraps up some of the training steps that I want to go through. Um, but are there any questions? All right, cool. Let's see, how much time do we have left here? All right, cool. This will be good. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So let's go back to our models here. And let's add this one to our, <coughs> to our workspace. We'll go ahead and set this to vector input and we'll go ahead and run remotely. So once we have a model trained, um, I know we've, we've gone through a little bit of these details, but I think it's helpful just to go through it again and sort of see um, how these things, how these work with our custom model. Cool, so we have a bunch of images here. Um, so again, you can download these one by one if you wanted to. Um, what I recommend probably playing with is the export function. So let's go over to exports. And we've got two options here um, within our exports. We have a generate images. Uh, this will do what we could do from that final training screen as well, is we can set um, the number of images we wanna download. Um, so we can set this to 500. Um, <clears throat> We can set our truncation. So just know that um, you can only set truncation once. So it's not like you can say like, I want, a ran I want, a I want 500 images of random truncations. Um, instead, what you have to do is you'll have to set it to 5.5. They also set this to 100. And they'll do 100 at 5, 100 at 6, 100 at 7, 100 that sort of thing. So these, these are sort of locked together. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the cost, uh, you'll see it's one cent per image. So again, this is much cheaper than going through that model and playing with them one by one, um, but you will get random images. And the problem with this is that you can't, you don't know what vector this is at. So um, I, I recommend playing with this and just sort of generating a lot of images to sort of see what you have in your model. Um, but in the end, I think a lot of times what we're gonna do is we're actually going to um, look at individual vectors and play with that. One second. Two hours of talking, hitting my limit. Um, Okay, so um, the generate lane walk, we looked at this a little bit last week, but I wanna cover it once, once again. Um, what's cool about generating late walks using this tool is that you have a little bit more control than you used to um, before. So in this case, let's say, um, let's refresh some of these here. I don't love these samples, let me, um, Let's crank this up a little bit, let's say 0.7. So the way to generate a latent walk using this tool is that you actually set a bunch of points, right? This is a little bit nicer here. So I'm gonna um, actually replace this step. So let's replace this first one. Let's choose this one. And then let's choose for the second step, let's choose this pink one. And then for this last one, let's choose the blue. And actually, yeah, this is good. So let's, uh, oops. Let's do blue and then we'll do this one here. So what this is gonna let us do is this is gonna let us do an interpolation where we're gonna go, we're gonna animate from this image to this image, this image to this image, and this image to this image. Um, and then you'll see in, in between here, you've got a, how many steps you have between each of these. Um, I generally recommend starting with sort of a small number. Um, like something like five seconds is gonna feel pretty good. 15 seconds between these images is gonna feel really slow in my experience. Um, and then you've also have these easing curves. So I can sort of ease, do I wanna do like a sort of ease in out? Um, I sort of like ease in and out for all these. Um, it just makes everything feel a little bit smoother, um, but you can sort of play with these values. Um, <clears throat> so now that I've sort of set my view, my points, I can, um, this is again, this is sort of the, uh, the trunk, the, the latent walk that it was able to produce when you go to the very end of screen of your training um, is a random one. So this gives you more control, uh, which is kind of nice. So once you've set up some controls here, um, it will give me an estimated cost. Uh, it looks like this is gonna cost me 50 cents. Um, 
which is probably pretty good if I count up the number of frames it's going to produce. Um, it's probably still pretty cheap. Um, I can set my frame rate, I can set my truncation value. If you change your truncation value, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Yeah, your images down here don't edit, don't get edited. But if you change your truncation value, these will be different images. So just make sure that you change the truncation value before setting these images. I'm just going to set it back to 0.7. Um, but yeah, if you if you edit this, uh, the truncation value here stays, but it will actually be different images um, because of how that truncation value works. Uh, so at this point, I feel like I'm pretty good with this, so I can go ahead and hit export video. Um, and then this will take, you know, just a handful of minutes to run. Um, so all of your export assets will exist inside of, um, inside of your assets folder in Runway. Uh, so this is a pretty nice, um, Runway has only really e recently added a couple of these features. So it's gotten better and better in terms of being able to do stuff directly inside Runway. Next week, we're going to go through a bunch of different examples of playing with this style game model and actually being able to affect our vectors using things like sound or, um, you know, being able to do more controlled manipulations, those sort of things. We'll also look at some examples just to produce some really cool looping videos. Um, one thing I should note, and actually let's go back here. Let me go to workspaces. Um, so this video um, will not loop, right? Because my start and my end points are different. But I can produce a looping video um, by, let's, let me just refresh here. So I can produce a looping video. If I set my first point to this blue one, and then I set my second point to, let's say, uh, this one, then I'll add another one. And let's say, let's do this one. Um, oops, I always do this. Set that one to that one. And then if I set my last one to the exact same image that I started with, this will loop, right? So if you think about this, this makes sense, right? It starts at a frame and it ends at a frame. And if those frames are the same, it'll loop. Um, so in this case, this is how I can produce a looping video. So again, I'm going to set this to five seconds, five seconds, and five seconds. Um, so this is a really simple way to do a looping video. And we'll actually look at how to do more looping videos next week um, using some different techniques. But essentially, this is like a fun way to just have a looping video that you can then upload to Instagram. And then it feels like it's never ending, right? Because you know people might not even see the loop happening. Um, so you can go ahead and export this as well. So there's some cool functionality here in Runway. Like I said, next week, we'll look at how to do some more advanced stuff with this. Um, but I just want to sort of like highlight that you can produce some pretty cool looping animations already directly from, from inside of Runway. Um, any questions about that? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the last thing I want to talk about this week, um, it turns out we won't do P5 this week, but I'll, it'll, that's fine. We have plenty of time next week to go over all of it. Um, where is this? Maybe I deleted the slides. Um, I was going to cover how to do hosted models, um, but I can talk a little bit more about it next week. But um, just so you're aware, there is a idea of hosting a model in Terra Runway. I'll, I'll include the video in our in our show notes or the, the class notes. Um, I have a video on how to set this all up. But basically, um, let's say you want to turn this into a website, right? So say you generate um, a cool dog model and you want every time someone hits the website, to get a new uh, dog image. If you were to try to do this by yourself, you would have to set up a very expensive GPU, um, set up some process to generate those images, and it would cost you quite a lot of money because you'd almost want to run it forever. Um, so what Runway has done is they've created a cool little thing that they call hosted models. Hosted models allow you to set up a model um, and then run it on a, on a web page. Um, and then basically anytime the model gets uh, Anytime someone asks for an image or requests something of the model, um, if the model has been down for an hour or two, it'll actually like shut down. And then um, you are charged per request. Um, so what's kind of cool about this is like, um, it's a much cheaper option. And all of the like technical side and details are, are held on Runway's deal. Um, I forget exactly what the cost is. So I'll, I'll pull on the slides and we'll talk about this a little bit more next week. Um, but I just want to make this aware, aware for you in case this is something you want to do as a project. Um, I think the hosting is like every time your, your model gets pinged, um, it's like a cent or two per request. So if you set up a website for like a, a day and then you like invite all your friends to come check it out, um, it won't be that expensive. Um, if your model, if your like website goes to Reddit, it might get pretty expensive, right? So like 
um, you know, a hundred people access your website once, that's a dollar. Um, a thousand people, 10,000 people, it starts to really get high in price. So just be aware of that. Um, but there is a cool feature. I'll include a little bit more notes in this. Uh, it feels like I must have deleted the slides. I'll include more detail about this next week. Um, but I think this would be a cool way if you like want to set up a project and share it with people. Um, using hosted models is a, is a pretty straightforward and easy way to set it up. Um, and it's fairly cost effective, all things considered. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. Um, so I think that's it for this that I have for this for this class so far. Um, any other questions? So next week we'll go over a bunch of like P5 JS stuff to manipulate our style game model. I'll show some examples of things that um, other folks have done uh, in order to manipulate style game using like text or sound or other things. Um, but I would start thinking about a little bit about what you want to do for your like maybe final project in, in the last week of class. Um, whether you want to do a style game model or whether you just want to do more exploration with models that already exist inside Runway. Um, yeah, so just give that some thought and uh, and maybe start working on, on those things. Um, again, I'm happy to help with anything. I know Claudia reached out to me um, about some some image scraping issues, um, but folks are always, you're always welcome to DM me or ask questions about stuff and I'm happy to help out where I can. Um, yeah, so with that, any other questions before we end class? All right, um, so I'll see everyone next week. Um, end a little early today, uh, which is fine. I feel like two hours is always pushing it a little bit, so an hour and a half always feels about right. Um, yeah, so we'll see everyone next week for some more advanced style game manipulation and other things. Um, and then we'll talk more about uh, final projects for the following week. Um, so reach out if you have any questions, I'm happy to help. Um, and if not, I'll see everyone next week. Bye, right. sir. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Cool. Bye. Thank you. Bye.